So we're, we're in chapter five. It's the last last chapter of the book. This chapter, you talk a little bit about choices, quick fire uh, choices for you. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm ready. Coffee or tea? Oh, <laughs> you're killing me, man. Coffee in the morning, tea in the afternoon. Pie or cake? Pie. Uh, books or movies? Books. Christmas or Easter? Oh, <laughs> Easter. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's no wrong answers. So yeah, so so choices. You write our calling in life is better understood as God given, rather than self chosen. Now, I read that, and as a Christian, I'm like, oh yeah, I, I like the sound of that. That sounds. <laughs> oh yeah, it's a good line, isn't it, man? <laughs> that, that jives with what I know to be true. But I think when I start to digest that. I think we all we all really, really struggle then with the thought or the reality of what that means. What what else what else am I except for the things that I choose to do? Um, so does that does that resonate to you? Yeah, yeah. It it goes back to this myth of the one great thing, and and my work with college students and and in pastoral ministry, is that we think we've got to we've got to find, and choose for ourselves our one great calling. But I want to just challenge people to think about it in this way. When you think about the faces, the places, and the spaces of your life and, and the callings you have, plural, how many of those did you actually choose for yourself? I'll, I'll put you on the spot. You know, do you get to choose the members of your congregation? No. <laughs> did you get to choose your mom and dad? No. How many of your neighbors did you get to choose? None. Uh, when you were in, in school, your classmates, do you get to vote, vote some of them off, out of the class? I would have liked to. <laughs> Actually, they would, they would have liked to vote me out, I think. But, uh. Yeah. Uh, and that's just this illustration that, like, I, I, we do make choices. You know, you choose who you marry, choose your career, where you go to college. I mean, so I'm not saying that there aren't important choices that you have to make. I'm just saying that, like, most of your callings you didn't have you didn't have a say in the matter, and so what does that mean then? That if these are given to us by God, what what? How does that change the way we look at the callings that we have? So that's a little bit about like our callings in life are are if we start to think this is given to me from God, this isn't necessarily something I chose. How does that transform the way we look at them? We spend a lot of time trying to figure out the right choices to make in life. And of course we seek God's wisdom and we talk to people that we trust and we read his word. Um, but in reality, uh, most, most of the things that you're asked to do in life, you, you really didn't have much say in the matter. I mean, you, you need to choose to say yes to what God has asked you to do. But I mean, I didn't, I didn't choose my parents. I didn't choose my siblings. God gave them to me. Um, and so we, we need to think about our callings as, as things that he has entrusted to us rather than simply things that we we get to decide what we want to do in, in life if i say that if you just start to think about your callings in life as what things that god gives you how would that change the way you would look at things well i call i say four sacred gifts of god-given callings one is the gift of god-given value in the people around me if your neighbor who might be cantankerous or a coworker who you really don't like or a boss who's, who's driving you crazy, if, if that's a calling that's been given to you, that means that they, they have eternal value because they have been made by God and redeemed by God. So it changes the way you look at people because they're, they're, not, peop they're not just things that you can choose and unchoose out of your life, but rather they're there. You have to decide how you're going to respond in a godly way. So God-given value is, is uh, one. Um, the if second thing is, jump in real quick, though, you just got me thinking, mm -hmm. uh, it, because the reality is we, we can, especially when we get older, we can walk away from our family. Yes. Yeah. Um, but perhaps, and, and, and a lot of people might have, have some solid reasons to do so. Mm -hmm. Um, as we think about families, though, and these these God given things, maybe maybe a helpful, and at least is the way I'm thinking about it. Rather than just complaining about the station you find yourself in, you ask, 
well, God, God put me here. God placed me within this context. You know, what, what is God trying to teach me? Yeah. What, what do I need to learn about myself or how to interact with other people given this circumstance, whether it be good or bad, you yeah. know, not, not do I like it, but what is God, what is God doing with this? Yeah. And, and praying that he reveals that we, I cause, I cause people stress and other people cause me stress. Like if we, we have the ability to walk away from people, yeah. but, but that's not what God's, yeah. that's not what God's calling us to do. He's actually yeah. calling us to go into, you know, to yeah. bear a cross and yeah. to go into these things so that, so that he might reveal his grace through us, yeah. but also teach and mold us to be more like him. If he's asking us to do something, he's not going to ask us to do something which we cannot do which he will not also empower us to do. So God given strength is this idea that, you know, he's going to, he's going to strengthen us even when it's really difficult and when it's, it's really hard. I think some of the, some of the most difficult callings that people have as expressed to me as a pastor, and it's the ones that were unexpected and were really hard. Yeah. And then, but to see those as, wait a minute, this is not, this is something God has given me to do that really changes the way you, you approach it. I think. Three, three women in the Bible who um, have, have wonderful stories of this. Ruth and Naomi being one. Terrible things happen. Husbands lost, the whole sake of identity gone. But, but Naomi says, like, I'll go where you go. Like, I'm going to, yeah. yes, yeah. This, is, this is where we find ourselves, but I'm, I'm going to choose to go with you. Yeah. And I think that's what God says to us, right? He goes, I'm, I'm going to choose to be with you no matter how hard it's going to be. Yeah, for sure. And in the same way, Esther experiencing a, what some may think is a, is a glamorous thing, like, wow, you get to be, right, a, a wife of the king, you, you could take, but it was hard, and her family was at stake, but but the, the faith was that God is up to something still, perhaps yeah. God has put you here for such a time as this, and she was able to serve the people well. The women connected with Moses' life, Miriam, Moses' sister, Moses' mother, and Pharaoh's daughter, not one of them had a, had a revelation from God. None of them were at the burning bush. God didn't speak to any of them directly. They just were faithful in doing this thing in front of them. And then God was doing this incredible thing, much, much bigger than them. Being a father of daughters, um, and not that they're daughters, but um, we love the movie Frozen 2. And, and I love, I love this moment uh, where Anna is not sure what to do next, but this idea of, of do the next right thing. I think there's some truth yeah. to that yeah. as we talk about vocation, right? Yeah. What is God calling me to do? Well, do the next right thing. The, the women in your example, yeah. they weren't looking to do big things, but the right thing to do was to rescue this baby out of the water, right? And then, and then see, look what God did with that. So, so perhaps the, what, you know, the prayer again in the morning is God help me to do the next, the next thing, right? Help me to do yeah. the next, keep, keep my eyes open for that thing that you're putting. Um, and I have no idea where it's going to go, but if it's right, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, and, and trust that God's got a much bigger plan for it. So in this chapter, chapter five, God given is, is the emphasis is on like it isn't always about this big choice that you have to make in order to try to find a way to serve God. It's more saying yes to the many callings that he's already placed there. Um, yeah, you, you were talking about these four sacred gifts, right? And you, you already mm -hmm. talked about value and strength. And then you have um, grace and yeah. joy. What, what are these gifts of grace and joy um, that, that God gives or that comes through these callings? Yep. So if you if we, again, re repeat this idea that think about your callings as God-given rather than self-chosen. If God gives them to you, you you're going to fail at them too. But he also is going to give you abundant grace when you do fail. Um, and so I think that returns to an idea earlier in the book about our baptismal callings. The, the more you start thinking about, all right, I've got lots of callings. They're happening right now. They're happening in the everyday ordinary life. They're happening in this world. And they're given to me by God. Holy moly, am I messing up, right? And so it's really important to know that when God gives us these callings, he gives us strength to carry them out. And he also gives us grace when we fail at them. So that's the third uh, sacred gift that's given. And the fourth one, the, the gift of joy, is that, th think about it in this way, a Christian and a non-Christian. You might be doing the same task 
I mean, you might have a non-Christian doctor, let's just say, say it that way. Um, and I, I'm, I, I hope that she or he is a really good doctor. And when I go to my, my doctor, I like, I don't really, in a way, don't really care if they're Christian or not in terms of my health. I want them to be Christian and know God, but like, they might be really good at that. But like a, the Christian doctor has a particular joy in knowing that these people are in my life by God's design for me to serve. Another example on maybe the opposite end of the uh, world's perspective would be the person collecting the trash on Sunday morning. Um, a non-Christian and a Christian can do that equally well. But a Christian has a particular joy in the way that they do it because Christians see that the, the world around us is full of these opportunities to serve God and that God is at work through us. And what joy there is to know that the almighty creator of the universe is extending himself through you in the care of, of the creation. God does such amazing things with, with, with uh, these ordinary means. I've been in this space, right? Where, where I, and I teach this and, and these things to look for um, that God gives you value and strength and joy. But, but I've also been in this place too. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, if I, if I come to you and I, I've read your book, right? And I say, okay, I, I get it. I'm, I'm in the dirt. I recognize my callings and I'm, I'm embracing them. I'm, I'm doing these things that, that God's given me to do and I'm trying to trust God, but, but I'm just not feeling valued. It's hard for me to feel that it, it's, I don't feel strong. I don't feel assured of grace. In fact, I'm, I'm starting to doubt and, and I'm seriously struggling to find much joy. Um, Cause I, I, I've been there <laughs> even as a pastor. I yeah. like, I know I'm supposed to be joyful and I, I, I know God's promised me to, that he's going to be here, but I, I'm just not feeling it. Um, what, what, how would you maybe counsel me or a person who comes into that's really struggling with this? Like, I get it, but I'm not feeling it. Yeah. Uh, great question. I mean, I think one, one thing to keep in mind, um, we, we're very aware, thankfully, in the Christian church about mental illness. And so I, I for sure have to say that you know, some people struggle with mental illness. Um, and that is not a shameful thing. It's some people just physiologically have a, a barrier to feeling joy. And that can be treated with counseling and medicine. And it's also a spiritual process too. So I have to say that. Um, but what, having said that, I think, um, I think it's maybe when you think about it in this way, um, that if the almighty God creator of the whole universe has said, I'm going to be at work through you, that you are my instrument. You are my gloves, the gloves of God, right? You are, you know, it looks like it's you on the outside, but it's really me working. Isn't that an amazing thing? I mean, you don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. And we can't even completely wrap our minds around it. But maybe thinking about it in that way, that God has chosen to work through me. And that's that's got a that's that's pretty cool. That's got to feel feel your heart heart up a little bit. So that's that's one thing I would say is is remember that joy of God working at work through you. The other thing is just always back to the gospel, returning to Christ and His work on the cross. We're always going to mess up. Even our emotions are impaired because of sin. You know, we don't feel things the way we're supposed to feel things, and so we 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 return to Christ. We repent of our sins, and we realize that you know none of this. Is going to affect our, our standing before God, that our our standing, our identity before God, and our eternal life is solely dependent upon what He has done for us in Christ Jesus. Uh, and and you mentioned even there's a time for us confession on, on page 140. You you kind of finish the story that you start telling about Pastor Paul and Gary, and what you end up describing is actually a, a personal private moment of confession and absolution. Mm -hmm. right, we're all we're all kind of familiar with a corporate confession and absolution where we all together either speak some words or maybe there's a moment where you kind of silently confess and then the pastor speaks the words of absolution and that's a, a reminder of God's grace and God's forgiving yeah. through those words but but what you describe here is kind of a, a practice that as far as I you know have experienced has kind of gone away yeah especially in the Lutheran church it's People think of it as a very Catholic thing, right? right. Why, why do you think it's gone away? And and what value might there be in, in reviving that that practice of 
coming and and confessing and receiving absolution in a, right. in a personal private setting. Uh, yes, we think it's a Catholic thing and partly it's because of in the late medieval church there was a lot of abuses and we would say bad theology, false theology connected with private confession. Um, but the reformers, especially Martin Luther himself, retained it, re reformed it, and revised it, but also retained it. And here's why, is that, you know, it's like this, when you do the general confession and absolution at the beginning of, of worship, that's a little bit like, that's like the super soaker. You know, you're, you're, you're probably going to get wet. Yeah, maybe going to get wet. When you're, when you're with another, either another brother or sister of Christ or with the pastor, there's a squirt gun is right at you. And that's in the good sense in that if you really are struggling with guilt and sin and shame, and you've heard the gospel a hundred times and you've been to church a hundred times, sometimes just saying it out loud to another person and hearing it from the pastor or from a brother and sister says, Christ has forgiven that sin. Mm -hmm. That enables you to say, look, I, I, I either got to believe the gospel or not at that point. Either what Jesus said is true or not. Yeah. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who I mentioned in the book, he, he also was a Lutheran pastor that really thought that retaining private confession and absolution would be an, an important thing. And he said it this way, um, that, that sin wants to be alone with people. It wants to hide in the shadows. And the more secret our sin is, the more disruptive it is, the more, the more alone we are in, in our sin. God wants it to be in the light. And, and sometimes um, the fact that we've kept this sin hidden or we've kept it, um, uh, we, 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 we think we've confessed it and we think we've heard the gospel, but we haven't. Um, Satan can do a lot of damage with that. And so I would just say to your, your people, if you're struggling with a sin in particular, say it out loud to somebody. Receive that word of Christ. Um, it, is, it is a miraculous, literally a miraculous thing. As, as a pastor at a college campus, I'm many times I've done in the individual confession and the assurance of forgiveness, and it's, it's life-changing for people. Yeah, I think I, I, I describe it in much the same way that when you and, and, and when you actually say the words out loud, they almost become, they become real, right? Yep. It, suddenly it's no longer something that's just in me. It's out there. It's, it's passed through sound waves into another person's ear. And yep. it, it's now a real thing. Yep. And, and, and one of the joys as a pastor then is to get to say, because of Christ, that thing, the thing you just named, the thing is out there, it's forgiven. It's gone. Yep. It's, it's saturated, right? You talk about a squirt gun, maybe it's like an ice bucket challenge. It's, right. <laughs> it's, it's been totally destroyed now in Christ, in your baptism. Yeah. gets back to that identity where, again, a, a physical reality in your baptism. Yeah. I, I, like to, I like to describe baptism as not something that happened to you a long time ago. It's something that, that you are. Right. You yeah. it's not like I was baptized. It's I am baptized. I am baptized. Yeah. yeah. It's and, like this fountain that's always flowing over you. Yeah. yeah. And you can always come back to it. That's, yeah. you know, it's uh, the Bible describes this, this joy, this, this grace, this love of, uh, of a spring, right? This, that springs up and it's welling up right. to eternal life. And in baptism, we, we can always go back there. You can always look at the cross, which is a physical reminder too of, of Christ's yeah. physical death for our sins. We can eat and, and receive Christ's body, which, which isn't dead, but it's alive and reminded that, that our future isn't, isn't in death, but it's in life. Yeah. Uh, and nothing holds us back from this, this life that God's given us to, to live. Amen, so, Pastor. Amen. All right. I've got one, one question to, to wrap things up. And you ended your book with an interesting story. And so I'm just curious to hear why you ended it this way. And you say that rainy evening, the, the room of a reconciled father and son brightened with the words of a familiar hymn sung by a son who knew both the burdens and blessings of a sacred calling. And then I'll, I'll read the, the hymn that you put there. In suffering be thy love my, my peace, in weakness be thy love my power. When the storms of life shall cease, O Jesus, in that final hour, be thou my rod and staff and guide and draw me safely to thy side. 
Uh, that, that section of the book was slightly partially uh, autobiographical. Um, as I was writing the last couple chapters of the book, um, my dad passed away. I had a good relationship with my dad. So the, you know, the reconciliation part wasn't, you know, that wasn't part of it. I remember sitting by my dad's bedside uh, in the nursing home and in the hospital. And I remember thinking back to, well, he changed my diapers and he looked after me and he fed me and he sat by my side. And now, now this is reversed. Sometimes, you know, this is again, our, our vocations are given to us. Like nobody chooses to care for a dying parent. I mean, that's not like, hey, I, I think I'm gonna, that's the one great thing I'm gonna do in life is, you know, um, care for a dying parent. But it, 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 it and so I thought of it as a calling. So it was slightly autobiographical in that. Um, I, I, I thought like, this is, this is a really important thing. Only you know how hard this is gonna be. Nobody's gonna give you a little ribbon. You, you don't even put it on a resume, you know, cared for a dying parent. But God is at work through those things. And those moments are sometimes the most sacred and important and, and um, God-pleasing moments that we have, if I, could, if I could say it in that way. Forgive me, it's, it's, not, it's not a big and flashy ending, right? right. It's not like, um, here's this major point that I'm just going to change your life with. It's like, you, you kind of ended the book with exactly how you, you began by saying, this, this isn't the most glorious thing, but isn't that kind of what, what this, this book has been all about, yeah. right? It's these everyday moments that you don't necessarily ask for, or if you're hard pressed, yeah. wouldn't even want, you wouldn't choose, right. but, but God's given them to you. And when you're faithful in them, when you trust God through them, even if suffering is at the end, right? Which is kind of, you kind of end the book yeah. talking about suffering. That's, that's not a glorious <laughs> ending. <laughs> But, but the very last, right, draw me safely to thy side. And that's, yeah. and that's, that's the, that's the life that we're in. It's, yeah. it's, it's got ups, it's got downs, but we know Christ has been through them before yeah. and with them, with us in them and through them. And it's, it's real. You don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, whether it's going to be joy or sorrow, pain or relief, but we know God's with us through it all. And he invites us in our various callings to, to be a part of his work. Does God need us? No, but he certainly chooses to use us. He chooses to use us, yeah. He chooses to use us. And that's, and that's a wonderfully glorious thing. We don't always know what, what he's doing, but we have to trust that his, his hand is there. Amen. Uh, could I ask you to, um, to say a blessing for uh, yeah. the people who have been participating and reading and and talking and doing life together could you could you say a blessing for us as we think about um, everything we've learned and talked about and look forward to the the god-given things um, we'll experience in the future yeah let's pray together almighty god heavenly father thank you for uh, the blessings and the burdens that you give us uh, we easily rejoice in the blessings but sometimes we've got to we got to rejoice in the burdens to know that you are at work through them I pray for this congregation, uh, the people that have been involved in this study. I ask that you would renew them, you give them hope and strength, uh, open up their hearts and minds and their eyes to the callings that are around them. Bless the work of the gospel in that place. Um, bless a pastor and his family and the whole congregation in the work that they do. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks so much for your time, and uh, it was it was it was a treat. I wish we yeah. had more time. But, this is uh, this is a blast. <laughs> <laughs>